introduce uh, myself. My name is Alice. Uh, I'm the lead. Uh, I'm the senior manager for Lead Capital Sangram Pakat. Okay. I do a simple in introduction about my company, Lead Capital. Okay. Lead Capital is one of the ten licensed uh, ECF operator, equity crowdfunding operators in Malaysia by Equity Commission. Okay. Um, we are actually here to help all the local uh, promising businesses to grow. So we raise, help them to raise funds, uh, guide them on mentoring all this. So we also play the role in bridging the gap between uh, the, the high potential companies with all the investors. So um, we are also part of the lead, uh, lead ventures, country seven ventures, if you notice, yeah. That's uh, the VCR, our venture capital and also uh, they are the accelerator that coach and mentor our uh, startups in Malaysia. So we actually nurture uh, more than 1,000 companies in Malaysia uh, and also another four more countries. So Lead Angel Club, this club is an uh, exclusive club that aims to bring uh, together sophisticated and angel investors. Yeah. So our angel investors uh, typically want to diversify their investment uh, across uh, scalable startup businesses and SMEs. So our mission is to connect angel investors from Malaysia and Southeast Asia uh, to discover deals in Malaysia. So we try to bring all the investors here. Okay. So if you have any quality deals you would like to bring to our angel club for other investors to consider, please let us know. Yeah. Sometimes you also run educational talks to provide uh, the latest industry updates and also the market trends to our investor, like what we are going to do today yeah, on the space technology. So I hope we can work together to make Malaysia a better place for promising startups to grow and expand. So let me uh, now let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Noriumi Amelia Ismail is the senior lecturer at USM, University of Science Malaysia. She's also the founder and CEO uh, of Spain In, a small satellite manufacturer company for IoT application. She holds a master degree in space mission, analysis and design, and a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of uh, Glasgow, uh, United Kingdom. He was, she was given talks at various events on satellite technology and the new space economy and is actively involved in the space education program. She was recently selected as a mentor for Space for Women 2023 mentoring program initiated by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. So let's put our hands together to welcome Dr. Noromi for sharing. Thank you for the kind introduction. I think uh, she really talks about me. And maybe I can add more. I, you know, I, I've been in industry for 10 years. I think this year we become 11 years and actually evolved from lecturer then I actively involved in volunteerism on this space uh, initiative in Malaysia because during that time we see that there is no push factor for the space industry so we start with the NGO first then I see that to propel or to accelerate this industry we have to do something or be part of the industry so I'm deciding to part of that and from the uh, space scene. So today uh, we're going to talk a bit on the space economy. Uh, this is, I think you can ask me uh, throughout the, the sessions, you can stop me and ask me the question. Uh, I don't really give any technical, just overview, especially on the Malaysia space industry so that you can have a feeling what happened now for the space industry in Malaysia. Whether the styling will come in or not is another thing that we have to think about. And uh, what is the challenges that we're going to face if we have this industry or we have company that are running this industry. Okay, but uh, we have to look on the definition of the space economy. So I give you two uh, popular definitions. All the space people will use these two uh, definitions from the Habit Business Review, which is, is cover everything. You can see everything. Uh, from the goods to the services and and also the use of the space itself. And it's not only around the earth, it's beyond than that. Moon, Mars and other planetary. And we can also say, say by OECD that this is full range of activities that use 
all the resources, which is create something that provide value and also will benefit you. Right? And this need, uh, we need to explore. Yeah, industry, this industry need lots of explorations. Uh, we need to understand how this work and also how we can manage and utilize the space. That's the reason why sometimes you heard that people go chasing comet or mining something that um, using meteor and mining something there because they they actually trying to utilizing anything outside the earth but can benefit the humankind uh, in in this world. And we see in, you know, for the global market here, uh, this is the most current report that I can found. You can see that uh, now is 469 billion for the market for the space industry. And we know that most of people now looking towards at 2040 is becoming 1 trillion. It's a very big, lots of reason. One of them on the communication side, we have lots of constellations. And also remote sensing also have a lots of constellation, lots lots of satellite up there. But there is a risk that we have to look for, and the risk can be converted also as opportunities. Then uh, we can see also 49.1 percent is coming from the commercial product and services, and 30.7 actually supporting all this activity, which is for the infrastructure and other things. Commercial space products like satellite. Uh, uh, Cover lots of things, uh, uh, infrastructure, launcher, ground stations, and we can see more uh, anything that will be actually supporting this uh, space market. Something like insurance, finance is part of, of that too. Which is in Malaysia, people know about space is only satellite, rocket, these two things. But the most important is also finance. Insurance is very, very important. Even if we launch balloon, we launched balloon before. And uh, during that time, we don't really think about insurance. But nowadays, because we know the risk of launching balloon and also we can get hurt because if we'll be landing somewhere, we need insurance for that. Of course, for the satellite and others, it needs insurance, especially if you launch something very, very expensive, very big. So insurance is part of the cost. The major cost for the satellite and also others. And we will see on the key industry growth area, the growth area is really significant in communications. We know a few companies like uh, SpaceX have a Starlink and Amazon also have their own constellations. And what else? Uh, I think uh, OneWeb from UK also have constellations. So communication is the key area. I'm going to go deeper after this. And also national security. Yes, we know that space actually really important for national security. Uh, remote sensing is really important in Asia, but we know that this is uh, remote sensing in terms of the image of the satellite. You can use image of satellite, or you have the sensor that can send something. Uh, you can send from the satellite and send uh, back to the ground stations. So this is kind of the remote sensing and also supply chain management. You can track your lorries, you can track uh, whatever activity they use and also the cybersecurity is part of the growth area. And this is where uh, on the report for the startup space company investment, you see that it's increasing tremendously from 2020 to 2021, in which is more Acquisition now, you can see public offering also increasing a lot. And uh, I can see, I think okay, this one's better. Uh, you can see that annual investor also play a major role for space investment. I think at the earlier uh, phase, we really need capital. Uh, but maybe during that time, some of the uh, investor still need validation on the technology. But we have angel that can help us to do to do something for the POC for the uh, uh, to, to to make sure that this technology demonstration can be work and others maybe you can go for the investor. So you see that in 2021 this report is taking the data from US, Japan, Singapore, UAE. It's not only US. So lots of data they take from uh, by the uh, price tag here. 
So you see that, uh, of course, venture capital is significant here as compared to others. But we, can, we, all, we also see that and the investor is part of that. And how about in Malaysia? So you, we go back to the background of the history of Malaysia's space sector and why we don't really heard about that. Uh, this, that's the reason on that. So we actually started as a commercial space industry. Earlier, in the beginning of the earlier, we, we lead this industry in South Asia. In 1996, we already have MESAT to launch a few satellites, but they not build the satellite. They buy the satellite from Nevada's Boeing, then they use the satellite uh, for the communications. Then we can say that this during that time, we already have the industry, but the industry only have a one three year. But then uh, in 2000, uh, Malaysia think that we need something to push on the scientific uh, community. And uh, during that time, actually, uh, we go for to, uh, 2020, well, Vision of 2020. And one of them to have like a scientific community, uh, space is one of them. So they push uh, for this, then they have this uh, program we call that Tiongsat, and we launch a satellite. Tiongsat is not that big, just this kind of big satellite, uh, working with Saris Peace Center. Then we also have the Kakasa One program, which is quite controversial, but we have this program, and because of so also this program is coming from the exchange of the Vibai, Vibai Sukhoi, then from there, actually, we can sign a Kasawan. And also, my school during that time, I'm studying in USM, received lecturer from Russia. So I've been taught by Russian. Russian and Indonesian, only one Malay lecturer during that time. It's quite difficult. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, on, in 2009, uh, we launched Razaksat. So we, during this time, we're thinking that oh, we already have all the engineers to make a satellite, why not we make our own? So they have this Razak site. Uh, this Razak site actually developed by to, uh, APSB. This is under the company under finance ministry. And also uh, they partner with Satrak, company from Korea. So the design uh, actually coming from the Korea, but they integrate everything. Uh, the payload itself, so we have satellite. Satellite actually have a bus system and also a payload. The payload is the main thing that we determine the mission. So the payload during that time is a camera so to, for, uh, for remote sensing for the Earth observations. So we have this Razak site. It cost us 114 million, something nearly, or 149 million ringgit Malaysia. Oh, yes, it's quite a lot. Uh, one of the reasons because of the insurance. Insurance is very, very expensive during that time. And also they're going to launch with SpaceX. SpaceX launched the first commercial satellite. So they really need a good insurance for that. So insurance is part of that. So we launched the satellite and unfortunately it only lasts for one year and we lost the communications. People said, people said that we actually fail with this uh, satellite program, but for us, as a researcher, we are not because we learn a lot from Razak site. What's the difference, difference between Razak site and others? Razak site for the first time sent to the equatorial orbit. So orbit uh, at the equator, they're going to move around equator only. But for normal satellite, they go for like sun synchronous, which is sometimes we get only four times a day for the coverage. But for the equatorial, we can get more. So for our for my satellite also we, we go for the equatorial and equator has a special environment there and because of Razak site they learn so much from there and I think all the data uh, they got then uh, another country make a satellite like Singapore sent to the equatorial orbit also so they learn something from Razak site then you see that 2009 to 2018 is quite a long time why because of the failure of Razak site. People will say that well, we, government waste money, don't do anything related to uh, to the space, so there's nothing happened. But then this is era which university trying to do something because industry can't do anything on that, and only Miasat do all the things 
and because they have a lot of money already. But other company they can't grow during this time because of the perception of the citizen public said that space actually a waste of money. So university trying to change that. And one of the university, uh, UITM, launched a satellite. They learned how to build the satellite. And this is where uh, we, we start using very small satellite. So this is CubeSat, 10 by 10 by 10. And yes, it, it has a limitation on the mission, but still we can do much thing about this satellite. Then the next is where from 2000, I think from 2020 to now, we have a, a few companies emerging in this industry. So space in one of them, we have Affilia, Independent X. It's, it's actually all, all this emerged during, most of the time during the COVID time. Maybe they think about something can be happened because of space. So uh, we have a few companies in this sector during this COVID. And uh, I will touch more about another company called Ankasa X also, which is going for the constellation. So you can see that during this time up to 2018, it's more on the traditional space we call that. And most of the program is funded by government. But then a uh, new space started. A new space meaning that more private entities coming in in the industry you can reduce the cost of launching the satellite lots of things happen so what is new space we have to know the new space now so you can see the difference between new space traditional and also the new space here so traditional normally uh, for the space program goals set by the government but new space you can do anything based on the market what the, the demand of the market you can go for that and also there is no boundary uh, you can this is based on the market force and for traditional they really look for the low risk activities as compared to the new space they're taking the risk because they know the market there they can get more revenue but the risk is very high then uh, for the traditional we normally have the public financing but new space it need innovative business strategy how to finance this uh, program for the space. So you can see the trend for the new space. Now we are in the era of new space. It's more on the upstream. Okay, upstream. Uh, I can. I will explain you what is upstream, what is downstream. So upstream is more on you build something, you build satellite, you build launcher, you build something that uh, you have to launch up there. And this is upstream, did lots of hardware. So this is upstream. But downstream is the application that whatever you have built and launched to the space. So like you have a satellite that send an image, you use that image to create a business. That's a downstream. You have a data, you create a business. This is IoT. And also uh, something not related to the satellite and other thing, which is space tourism. We know that uh, Orbit, oh sorry, Virgin Orbit already uh, flew for the uh, space tourism and Blue Origin also sent somebody uh, for the space tourism. So space tourism will take another uh, sector in this uh, space industry. And space mining, people are looking for the space mining too, uh, in the moon, uh, in the meteor and other things. And also the other key is disruption, disruptive market solutions. So it will be the integrated services. So you have satellite, you have also data, and you integrate, then you get another services. This is another kind of new space trend. And it's normally lower price because of now we have a small launcher. When you have small launcher, you have small satellite, and you can reduce the price. I think a launcher now, they are fighting to each other. No, I mean fighting in terms of the technology-wise where lots of company building launcher now and it's good for us uh, for the satellite company because now we can just uh, shopping around look who actually give us the best price even in malaysia uh, i think last two weeks we heard that sabah want to have launcher so they are starting to actually study about the, the place to have this uh, part for the launcher space part so you can see that uh, people can think about having something that 
Once upon a time, it's very big, but now because the cost is reducing. Another, uh, uh, the, another factor is the manufacturing cost also can be reduced. We have the 3D printing technology. So 3D printing actually reducing all the costs. So you can make your rocket, you can make your satellite with cheaper solutions. And also now we have a private investment and, and the mechanism for the funding is different. So this is where uh, this trend for the new space taken place. So from here, we can have lots of exciting industry, exciting company that come out from this kind of uh, trend. And we have a look on the ecosystem in Malaysia. So people, lots of people ask me what we have in Malaysia. So you can see that Malaysia have, yes, we have upstream in terms of the satellite manufacturing, satellite operator, rocket launcher and, and rocket launcher and rocket or launcher manufacturing. So Miasa is satellite operator. They are not making satellites, so they are only operator. Uh, they operate uh, and give us services. Uh, a few company uh, develop a space system like uh, us uh, from Space In. We have our own satellite. Angkasa Air also will develop their own satellite. Another company called uh, Affilia also we're going to have another satellite. So they are building satellite, independent X building launcher. So this is company on the upstream side. It's not so many, but they are there. So we can see a few players in the upstream. But in downstream area, actually, we have lots of company. I can say if you heard about Katsana, we can categorize them as the downstream because they use satellite data for the tracking. So this downstream and lots of company on the image of the satellite used for the agriculture, oil and gas and other things. So this is downstream. You can see that government actually spent 20 million just to buy image of the satellite every year. 20 million to buy uh, image. Uh, we should have our own satellite and we don't have to buy, but because we don't have the satellite, then we have to buy the, 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 the image for 20 million per year. So they, uh, for government, they think that we have to do something on this. So they are going for the small satellite for Earth observation. Uh, this is inside, we call that Malaysian Exploration uh, 2030. I will explain later on this. And you can see revenue in communication is quite huge because of MIASAT. And then we have education like university. There is three universities that providing a program for aerospace that includes space. Only UPM, USM and IIUM. And research, lots of uh, uh, university, government agency doing research for space science, space tech. And also we have this non-space education. And we also have a start up in this non-formal space education, like Upper Dilangi, Generasi Mare, which is a part of the space economy too. And this is very important. Uh, we know that space is space actually heavily regulated. So, Malaysia tried to have this policy and regulation. So we start with a policy created by, during that time, we called that ANGKASA, Malaysia Space Agency. But then uh, they, they combined remote sensing and ANGKASA called MISA, and they established national space policy in 2017. And policy itself is not enough. You need something to regulate for this activity. So they want to have the Space Act, so uh, in 2022, they uh, go to parliament and try to establish Space Act. And actually, uh, it got approved uh, in 2022. And then this year, they're going to have a space board. Space board uh, actually governed by MOSTI as the coordinator, but lots of other agencies like civil aviation, uh, MCMC also inside that space board. So, it's still very new and it's no regulation or act is actually published yet. So when we do this space activity, we have to keep going to ask them whether we can do this or not. For example, launching a rocket. There is no regulation to launch the rocket below 100 km. For your information, space is defined 100 km above. So anything down, 100 kilometers is not governed by the Space Act. So you have to work with civil aviation. 
So for me, I have experience launching a rocket. Uh, we help uh, one company from Singapore, Equatorial Space System, to launch a prototype of their rocket. So what I'm, I'm doing is I'm using whatever regulation we have. So we have regulation for balloon because I know that I, I know the regulation because I launched the balloon. And we combine with the tabuhan api in English, what? Tabuhan api. Ah, yeah. In English. But you know tabuhan yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. api. Meaning that if you have this tabuhan api, you need a bomb squad to be with you during launch. So we launched a very small satellite. Oh, eh, sorry, very small launch. Explosive. Yeah, explosive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's two times I've launched the rocket. The, the first one is a very small rocket. We have bomb squad beside us. <laughs> but the next one, when we launched like one, two meters uh, rocket for the Singapore uh, company, they're also there, but it's, uh, it's success uh, launch and they get all the data. It's become a milestone for them for the fundraising. So we can launch here, but we have to uh, use whatever we want to have first. Then we have to go all the authorities to get permissions. So it's quite hustle and there is no specific area to test your launcher or your rocket. It's also another things that we have to look for. But I know that's all actually doable when you talk to agency and explain to them. So this is the space policy. It's not much to see on the space policy. It's more on where actually the direction on them. But this space policy uh, emphasize on Earth observation satellite. This is where our nation want to go, the, the, the direction that they want to go uh, to have our own satellite for the Earth observations. But the most important coming from that policy is the Malaysia Space Exploration 2030, which is, this is their target up to 2030, it's going to be 0 0.3, uh, contribute GDP, 0 0.3 of Malaysia GDP, and also create a job. And uh, we have this uh, satellite, our own satellite, and want to become a top three in the Southeast Asia and we want to self-dependence. We can compare now, so if I'm not mistaken, for the UK uh, space, they have 42,000 people working in that industry. You can see the difference. We, in 2030, we targeted 5,000. And uh, the market in UK is 16.5 billion. And Singapore, they have like 30 companies for space. And Recently, this year, the government of Singapore uh, allocated 150 million for R&D for the space only. So dedicated program for the space. So because they see the space actually can give lots of benefit to the country, so they invest more, the government invests more on that. And uh, in Malaysia space exploration, there's a few vertical they are looking for. One on the small satellite, for the Earth observation. And another is actually they want to develop 10 space incubators. This is what they plan. But looking at, at this, uh, lots of challenges they have to go through. And I'm when I'm starting the company, I go this kind of the, uh, the type of challenges that I'm looking at, uh, I'm actually facing. First on technology, funding and regulation. So going deeper on that. So for the technology, uh, we can see that it's still infant in Malaysia, but we can speed off any other technology. For example, uh, we have the RF technology, radio frequency technology, we can make antenna, but how we can use this for space? It's, it's a matter of the material can survive in environment and also far enough to send the data. So you need to work with people who understood about space and combine together, integrate all the knowledge, then you can get the technology. And the timeline for the technology development is really depends on funding and also the readiness. But if you see that if you go for the complex, very complex technology, like a big satellite for the launcher, 
or you invent a new technology, it will take longer. For example, here you see that SpaceX started development in 2015, but the first prototype is 2017. There's a company actually taking opportunities from the risk, having lots of satellite up there. It's a debris out there because people put lots of satellite. Then they say that oh, somebody needs to clean up everything. So this company called Astro Scale started to do this uh, business. And they start to develop this satellite that can catch uh, the, another satellite uh, and put, at the, uh, put the satellite in other orbit or deorbit it. Uh, and it took like from 2018, uh, developed this satellite and launched in 2020. But still, the services is not fully, uh, what we call that, uh, operated yet. Uh, they're still looking the best way how actually to get all the satellite and trying to throw away somewhere so that uh, this becomes sustainable for them. And also the technology is looking on the hardware versus software. Maybe uh, software can go very fast. Hardware, you need time, especially if you don't have the technology, you need to import that technology. So we're having problem importing technology from US because of the import uh, restrictions. So instead of import from US, maybe you have to import from Europe, which is quite expensive. We, we experienced this to buy only solar panel. We, if we bought from US, it's actually less than we buy from Europe, but we don't have any uh, options. So we go for this, uh, 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 sorry, uh, we go for, for the solar panel uh, coming from Europe. So it depends also how actually you manage this technology. And to make a satellite, you have to know the timeline. Uh, this is actually uh, include a few uh, important elements. The first one on the design is either you design from scratch or you take from the heritage. Some company, they want to go very fast, they take from heritage. Heritage meaning that there is a company that already built the satellite, they just buy the satellite, they only design the payload. So they put the payload inside that. So it will accelerate uh, the development, but it will cost you on the final side. And if you see here, satellite without heritage may take from six months uh, for the very small satellite to two years to complete development. It depends on the size of the satellite. Then you have also to apply for the frequency. This is very important without frequency, you can launch your satellite. This is, uh, I think if you launch from India, maybe some flexibility here for, 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 for you to launch. But if you launch from SpaceX, of course, they want to see you are approved. The frequency is already approved, then they're going to bring you in uh, for, for the launch. And for the frequency coordinations, you have to get approval from International Telecommunication Union. This will take six months to one year to be completed. So timing here, you have to plan properly. So we, we actually, our first time when we apply for frequency coordination, we apply quite late. So now we still actually trying to get uh, feedback from, we call this ITU, whether it's approved or not. Uh, we're supposed to be launched in June. Uh, unfortunately, there's another uh, organization that uh, approved our frequency, which is for the emitter frequency. Uh, we need to reapply for that. And our launch uh, is blessed in disguise. The launch actually moved by the deployer to October. So we still have more time to apply for the frequency. So it will become go or no go for your launch. With the frequency. So is this is very uh, if you use the same frequency, uh, for example, you have constellation, you have the same satellite, same frequency, but many there, only one time. But if you have different satellite by different and different frequency, you have to reapply. And you also need to apply license from our local authority, MCMC, uh, to provide satellite services. This is actually the one become the also big obstacle from the startup because applying license for commercialization, you need to have like 50,000 ringgit for approval. Then you would need 10,000 ringgit for membership. 
another 10,000 ringgit for other things. So not something for this, but it's uh, last for 10 years. Uh, so this is quite a big capital for this, but once you've got uh, the services, you have, uh, you can do lots of things. But uh, when you calculate uh, on your revenue, you have to include everything on these frequency coordinations. Then next, you have to test your satellite. So testing, you have two choice, whether you go to the, we call the assembly integration testing facilities, which are available in the country. We have in my site, Banting, or you build your own. So if you go for the testing facility, you have to pay for the fees. You have your own, then you, you can test uh, in-house and reduce, maybe reduce the cost. Only to setting up that facilities will cost you a bit more uh, at the beginning. And when you want to launch a satellite, there's a two ways. First, you choose your launcher first, design the satellite. Or you design the satellite, you choose the launcher that's suitable for your satellite. Normally, we go to choose the launcher first because we want to know the size and everything. We know where this uh, launch should go and we can plan. Uh, normally, they already have the uh, manifest. They already manifest the time when they're going to launch. So from there, we can do our own schedule. So we have to shopping first where there's a launcher that we will use. Uh, so for us now, because we want to launch for the equatorial, we have to look somewhere launcher that have the service to equator, which is not many. Uh, it's more, uh, I think many of them in India. So we're going to deal with Indian government and also uh, maybe start up there they're having launcher for this equatorial. So testing and launch actually another things that you have to do. So this timeline to have to be taken into consideration. The reason why uh, we take some time to launch our product uh, for, for this uh, satellite. And also for the funding, of course, a major funding, uh, major cost will be on the launch cost, depends on the size of the satellite, how uh, the weight of satellite will determine the launch cost. The cheapest now is SpaceX actually. It costs you like one kilogram for 5,000. If you are the broker, you can get the cheap one. But if you actually the client to the broker, maybe it's quite expensive a bit. And also for the insurance. And on if you have something complex technology, like the one for the astro scale, maybe this technology cost also will be a major cost. And also you have to build a ground station, but this actually not really major cost because nowadays we have something like Airbnb uh, ground station, meaning you can rent somebody else ground stations, they will do for you. Amazon also have this kind of business too. And then the licensing also another cost uh, that you have to look for. Another thing, the challenge here on the frequency uh, in the world, we have three regions for the frequency. We are in the third region, US in the first region, and in the middle one, the Europe, maybe the second region. So frequency that you use in the second region can be used in the third region. If you make a satellite using the frequency in the third region in Malaysia, you may not use in second region. So you will not have a market in that area. So you have to do something in order one, if you plan to have a market in Europe, so you have to think which frequency is suitable uh, for that area. So this is something that you have to look for. And also uh, currently, because we have this uh, space act, uh, they're going to have a permit to launch. So the launcher need to apply for the permit, another cost for that. And another thing is you have to deorbit, meaning that you can't stay forever up there. Uh, we know that certain satellites have a few life, uh, life, lifetime. For example, very small satellite can be three years, but if the big satellite can be like maybe, and uh, they're going to launch, I think, in two years' time. So unless actually go for the communications, we have a constellation, 500 satellites to cover Southeast Asia. And we also have IoT. For my company, I'm focusing on IoT because uh, for IoT, we are focusing more on machine to machine connectivity. I can reduce the cost using very small satellite because the data is not that big as compared to communications. 
So the sunlight is not that big also. And we can have a few main players as from past three years. Swarm, Swarm actually the IoT company in US and being bought by SpaceX. So you can see that actually uh, IoT is also one of the vertical in space technology that going up very fast. And now, uh, I told you before that we have a small launcher. We know that small launcher will be the next uh, because it's going to reduce the launch cost. It's a new market for equitable launch, not many players yet. So in Malaysia, I think independent X trying to get that. And also we have this 3D printing technology, accelerate this development. And there's a company, Skyroot. Actually, uh, now they got funding from VC, VC from Singapore. So Skyroot will be next, uh, having this small launcher. Uh, we have five fly from UK, sorry, this is a rocket lab, you know, rocket lab, already at go, and also independent X in Malaysia. And we have a new tag, so you can go for the space propulsion. Uh, instead of using fuel, you can use water to propel. Uh, also, space power in Malaysia, there's a company called Aphelia trying to, to have wireless charging for satellite. And if they success on proven this technology, I think it's a very, very big uh, company. They, they, they're going to be very big because most of the satellite need power. If you can, what is charging your satellite, you can actually do something more. The space debris that I told before, and also space entertainment. There is a company in Japan actually use artificial uh, meteorites. They do the, the artificial stuff. So they, they go, they, they launch, sorry, they release a very small particle. Uh, they calculate uh, if the, uh, they want to do the entertainment in UAE, some calculation on the orbit, and they release that. And when it actually pass by the atmosphere there, they say entertainment there. So lots of things also coming in from the entertainment. Uh, Sony also want to do something. Remotely, you can control the satellite to take a picture. Up there. So something that we can't really think before that's happening, this is where actually lots of opportunities for the space there. And uh, you see that certain application, I, I told you that the revenue is 14.84 billion. Uh, we have Spalling, a plan to have 5,000 satellite. It's quite a lot at the local orbit. And also we have the MSX. And IoT, of course, IoT can be used for the oil and gas, for the agriculture, asset management, and also transportation. The use case, one of these uh, can be used for the uh, oil and gas. This is a company called Hyber. It's already been uh, acquired by another company, IoT, big IoT company. But this company works with Shell for oil and gas. And this is, you can see that they can reduce the number of well trips. So the engineer needs to go to the well. They can reduce by 83% by using space IoT. So we, you can see that IoT actually can really help re uh, to reduce the, the main power usage of the main power, and also other. You can get more data and maybe improve for the agriculture productions. And uh, this is coming from my side. Actually, this my satellite pocket cube. Pocket cube actually five times five times. Very small satellite, and uh, this satellite is started in Glasgow. They already proven that uh, pocket cube can be used on specific missions. So Alpha Orbiter use pocket cube for Earth observation. They want to see uh, the night time at all area in uh, in the world, so they can see uh, the populations and also activities uh, during the. Uh, on inside the area. Then we can go for the fleet management of cross agriculture. So I'm trying to use this very small satellite uh, for agriculture, mainly for this agriculture. Because when you reduce the cost of your services, you can penetrate agriculture too. I know that, yes, we have a Sanda, we can afford to have similar services, but how about others? We give the opportunities for others uh, actually to use these satellite services and increase on the productivity, and this is very important for security. So we have this data taken um, directly from the sensor, 
and it, when it passed by the ground station, it is sent all the data. The data is sent to the data center, which is we have cloud there, and user can actually look for their data using the user interface. And also, the observation is good for the, of course, for the species of farming and also for the meteorological supply. This is widely used uh, for the meteorological department and also for the uh, agriculture. So, the challenge on the, this sector is on the regulation. The space debris is more, more satellite up there. Uh, people ask me whether you're going to collide with other satellite. Are you, uh, and have you think about how to maneuver that? And also uh, on the application side, uh, we really need to map the usage of this satellite to the market. Uh, for me, when I enter in this business, I'm look for the low hanging market, which is IOP, and and need not that very very big uh, capital. So this is where I can start. Of course, funding is one of them. So, in conclusions, uh, we have to look on the readiness on the market. I can say that uh, if you know how to match uh, the applications with the market, whatever we have here, actually, you can be creative and you can use that uh, for the usage of the satellite and getting benefit the satellite from, from the satellite to, 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 uh, to the sector that maybe not really related to satellite before. Then this is the market. I, sh I think it's already uh, can be ready during that time. And also the the industry still need government support in terms of policy and regulations. And we have to push government uh, on the regulation side so that we can do our space activity in the manner way. And also we have to look at the sustainability uh, sustainable solutions. Sorry. Especially uh, when you're building an ecosystem. So you have the satellite company, but you have to look for also for the supply chain. You look for other things that integrate together with the industry. So this is will support the growth of industry itself. So I think that's all for now. If you have any questions, you may raise anything. I try to answer that. Thank you.